For those of you that have been watching, Trevor Jacob put out a video called I Crashed My Plane, which is probably the only truthful thing about the entire video. I mean, he's flying a new plane that he just bought that probably isn't airworthy, wearing a full-size parachute while having five GoPros on it and doing an advertisement for a Ridge wallet. Aside from that, it totally seems legit. In the original video, he's heading out on November 24th. From the angle of the sun, we can determine that he's leaving Lompoc at around 8 o'clock in the morning, plus or minus 20 minutes. Ostensibly, he's flying up to Mammoth to go drop off the ashes of his friend when his plane runs out of fuel or something bad happens, and then he crashes in the mountains. Um, but luckily, he's wearing a parachute and is able to jump out and then hike out. So we have a lot of different views from the video that we can use in Google Earth to figure out his flight path. Once you do that, you start to think, that's a very strange way to get to Mammoth. Okay, so let's get back to the flight. So he's got a GoPro mounted on a selfie stick. It's a nice selfie stick. And he's got something under his jacket. He's also got a water bottle sitting next to him. When I originally saw this, I thought he was panicking. But what he's actually done is trim the plane so that it's going to go into a nosedive. And then it's pulling back on it to be able to get level flight. I'm pretty sure this is not how his flight instructors told him to trim the plane uh, to achieve maximum glide. This is a great image. You can see the crash site, parachute landing site, and more or less the path that the plane has to take based upon all the views in the video. This also shows the location of a probable drone that was able to get the images where the plane was below the camera and probably allowed them to actually figure out where the plane crashed. Like any pilot who's trimmed his plane to auger into the ground, he's now grabbed his GoPro. Notice he's also had to reconfigure the GoPro and turn it on and grab that rather than a water bottle. Holy f I'm over the mountains and I get out of Asia now. You look over his left shoulder and I'm pretty sure those are two GoPros. There's a lot of speculation as to what this black thing is as well as the tube. I'm pretty sure it's the pedo tube that allows you to tell the speed and a GoPro. GoPro from before, that's now the selfie GoPro. As he bails out, we catch a couple of things. Aside from the fact that he's wearing a full normal parachute, he's got an altimeter, and it appears to be a fire extinguisher. So we can see the eventual crash site, we can see the flight path, we can kind of triangulate how far he falls and what's underneath him to figure out where the drop zone is and where he ultimately opens his parachute. So once he's under canopy, he looks up to his left to look at the plane. Obviously it's above him. There's no way that it gets below him in the time frame necessary to get those other shots. If he actually got those drone shots under canopy, the plane would have almost hit him and would have just crashed directly in front of him. Presumably there'd be a giant dust cloud in front of him for the plane just hit. Now as he's coming into land, the lens flares and the sun angle suggest that it's hours later than when he jumped out of the plane just moments ago. Aside from so now he comes in, hits hard landing, lands in the shrubs pretty badly. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Get me out of this. Get the off of me. Come on. Several people have noted that his jacket looks wet here. I think that's maybe possible. You only get a little bit from this view. I think the reason is you'd realize how long it takes that plane to hit the ground. In this next sequence, you can actually nicely triangulate the location where this is coming from. What you notice is that there's no rotation of the camera. It's got incredible stability, much more like a drone gimbal, and that over the time period, you don't lose any altitude. The other part is the location would be almost impossible to achieve from where he bailed out of the plane. Here's what it looks like in Google Earth. The other part that's weird here is the audio is clearly different than when he's under parachute, and the way he was holding the GoPro there's no way that the handle isn't in the view. If you know anything about drones, the one thing they don't do is capture audio. So the site here has been taken from all sorts of views that you can take from the video. You can see his bailout site, more or less where he pulled the chute. You can see what I'm calling the drone view where the plane flies underneath him. You can see at the 353 uh, time point of where he's just coming in to land, the landing zone, and the crash site. Now, what you can see is also the plane route. And this plane route is approximately six to eight miles long. Now, the idea that that plane hits the ground before he lands is almost impossible, taking this route. If he did, 
as you can see in that 353 view, he's coming in and looking straight at that crash site. And you would expect a dust cloud or something from that, and you don't see anything. Now, to go along with that, if I was gonna crash in the mountains and try and find my plane, because it would be really hard to find, I'd certainly wanna have a drone up in the air. And the idea that somehow he managed to, manages to land a couple hundred yards from the crash site seems completely improbable. There's no way that he would have been able to track the plane down and get into that zone. So I'll share with you a theory. He bails out, he pulls his chute, he lands down in that river valley, and he and his friends head out of there for that day. They then look at that drone footage and they figure out where that plane actually has landed. And then they do a second jump. He lands in that landing zone right next to the crash site hikes down to it, and then hikes out the next day or sometime after the initial plane crash. There's a lot in the walkout that suggests that this is what happened. And here's the obligatory plane crash. He gets out, changes. Now, interestingly, you won't see that jacket ever again. I guess I should probably document what's going on. Got my elbow. Under. The sling chest harness shows up throughout the rest of the video. So happy to be alive. I'm just kind of taking in what just happened. Well, where the hell am I gonna land a freaking plane? Okay, so the time of day seems to be substantially later than when he took off by several hours. We can tell that from the shadows across the valley there. The other part is, as you can see, he's got his cell phone uh, out and he's using that to document this, which you can imagine is probably a pretty dumb idea if you might need it to rescue you later. And I'm gonna die. That's why I always freaking fly with a parachute. If you watch any of his other videos, he never flies with a parachute. Literally through the gnarliest freaking bushes. I got so much poison oak and freaking cuts everywhere. Ah! Ow! What the heck is this? It's not part of the parachute, so God knows what it is. Ow! Ah. I'll save you the trouble while he's looking for the plane. I spot the plane. I see it down there. Oh my god. Ow. From the angle of the sun, the lens flares, and the shadow line, we know that this is much later in the day, more like 12.30 or 1 p.m. Now, if you've watched this, you know that there's nothing very interesting about the plane wreck, so we'll just zip through that. Another hour's gone by. I'm down in this ravine. This is so freaking gnarly. Oh, ow! Ow! Ah! You're probably wondering, why is his parachute not packed in his backpack anymore? And why is he using his cell phone to shoot it? I have no idea what this orange thing is on his shoulder. Not creepy, but I feel like a mountain lion or a bear could definitely be watching me right now. I am in the middle of nature. Okay, so he worries about getting cliffed out and then gets cliffed out. Perhaps he knew he was going to get cliffed Here. out. This orange bag makes a series of cameos over the next few minutes. About an hour later, I am exhausted. I'm yeah. Is crawling. There's our friend the orange bag again. Bushes like I have been for the last five hours. And uh, I'm in pain, man. I'm hurting. Whatever I'm going through, I wish upon nobody. I see the ravine down there that I'm trying to get to, but I am still surrounded by bushes. We get a couple of nice views of the orange oh, bag. Looks like a bus pack. Way cheaper than it looks. Ah. I'm trying not to lose faith, man. I'm hurting. He's walking down the creek bed, past the cows, towards the Pollywog Lagoon that he'll drink from later. There's a few other random things here along the way. The entire time he's using his cell phone to film himself. Yes. Yes. I see water. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh. Oh. I don't even care if it's mud. There's fish in here. Tadpoles. 
And I bet this is where you'd be telling yourself, I better turn on the flashlight on my cell phone camera to make sure that I get a really good picture of me drinking tadpole water. <sighs> oh my gosh. It's never felt so good. Okay, let's get to the end game here. A car. A car. So here's a car. He runs towards the car. It turns out that they are, quote, farmers that have rescued him. This is probably where it's worth noting that he's wearing a sweatshirt with gray cuffs, and his jacket had black cuffs. So where do you get the sweatshirt? Also, think about how you'd have to be holding a cell phone with this water bottle in front of it to get this view, and think, yeah, that's natural. He chats with the farmers. They actually don't seem all that surprised. The end. It's all water. I started crying. I think we should thank the farmers too, as well as Trevor, for providing all of the Easter eggs and a lesson in filmmaking continuity.